Hello, beta testers. <laughs> Communication is how gamers best counter greedy practices. Word of mouth, reviews, impressions. These are all vital in a fight against studios forcing silence through embargoes with legal consequence for anyone actually discussing their defective products too early. So, in cases of games like Redfall that restrict information right up until the game's released, this effectively betrays a lack of confidence in their own product. Redfall was a first-party Xbox exclusive. Imagine if Spider-Man 2 did this, but we all know that it won't. Because Insomniac is confident in the game that they're making. Enough to show it, showcase it, give review copies out ahead of time so that people can inform themselves and their purchase. <laughs> the real villains in this gaming industry are dead set on lowering the bar to accept empty worlds, worse than 20 year old AI, low frame rates when the studios themselves actually promised otherwise, and are just constantly making excuses, but beta testers, it's good news time. Kotaku is now blacklisted by multiple publishers, but specifically Nintendo. The trans Hogwarts boycotters and their mindless allies have failed so severely that Hogwarts Legacy broke billion in sales. And this is before the PS4 and the X-Bone versions that statistically more people own has even released. Stellar Blade, Street Fighter on the horizon, putting attractive women back on the menu, Rocksteady Games has for the third time delayed their upcoming $70 always online Purple Weak Point Looter Shooter Sushi Squad after tired, dated, boring, battle pass and gear grind centric gameplay underwhelmed in a frightening enough capacity to convince them that they couldn't get away with kicking another defective and unfinished bucket of crap out the door. That's why it's delayed. During my coverage of Avengers, I mercilessly highlighted phrases, talking points, and saliva-soaked helmet strap ideologies of the willfully ignorant cocks that always have the same defense. But maybe after Avengers, when you saw these same excuses in Saints Row, the same incompetence in Gotham Knights, and now the same unwillingness to even acknowledge proof positive that the defective state of products like Redfall for some players make the game impossible to even launch, maybe you're starting to understand the impact of the mentality of it is what it is and it's not that bad, it'll be patched. Uh-huh, okay. Watching people defend this too cheap for cutscenes so we have image slideshows $70 game with AI so sad that we know Arcane apparently can't even watch a YouTube video. You know, for most problems that you can have, there's probably an Indian guy, an Asian person, a little kid explaining in a YouTube video a fix or a workaround. That's what this very platform used to be about, connecting people with what they wanted to see. Now, however, there's a bit of guidance, you know, some stuff to keep people in the right lanes because it's about what they want you to see. And they are the dishonest people giving things a one out of 10 because of politics. The truth of the matter is they cannot silence you. They cannot stop you memeing, and most importantly, they can't decide what you are not allowed to buy or decide that you're ists and phobes because you reject the low-quality garbage that they're just dying on a hill to convince you isn't that bad. Oh, this isn't ethical as far as you're concerned. It's not politically correct or safe enough. That's exactly why we like it. Surely these people are starting to wake up to the realization that whatever they hate just makes it more appealing for us. So I freely admit I take it personally. Everybody who's ever sent me glitches or bugs in something that they genuinely wanted to play after having financially supported it, it all reminds me of types like Jason Schreier, who are so quick 
to acknowledge the race of the majority of people working at the studio. But when the game objectively comes out and it's dog crap, they got to attempt to invalidate other people's proven experience that they avoid, you know, lest they melt like it's the Ark of the Covenant. But everything's working for me and people are just making a big deal out of everything. Oh, you speak for everybody now. That's pretty, in that's pretty incredible. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like, depending on who you ask, you can get a different perspective. For example, a Nazi might say that the camps weren't as big a deal as some people make them out to seem. And if that seems like an outrageous assertion, check out this tweet from Kotaku journalist, and I say this with air quotes, Luke Plunkett, who says, and I quote, for the record, this is how I feel about publisher blacklists, end quote. And then he posts this picture. In a deleted tweet, of course, to give you an idea of just how how hard they can stand by that racism. Naturally, trans people have come out in support of this disgusting behavior, solidifying which side, of course, that they are on. And these are the same people harassing Final Fantasy producers because their game isn't black enough. And it's just pathetic. Of course, people are cheering for the accelerated collapse of weirdos triggered by a wizard game, flinging their own and hero statistics at us like it's our fault that you're offing yourselves you know wings of redemption used to do that they used to do what the trans people are doing right now threatening people that oh, i'm gonna i'm gonna do it and i'm gonna put you in the note you know it'll be your fault wings of redemption is a lull cow and he knows better than to think that that's okay these days wings of redemption has shown more growth than people in the trans community than some of these degenerate wannabe games journalists? For anyone not aware, yes, it's true. These people are legitimately mad that this Japanese developed game is does not have enough black people in it. That it needs to be more Velma, more Lord of the Rings these days. And of course, it won't stop there. They need to have their way. The game's gotta go full Gayloy. They're already complaining that there wasn't enough representation in Jedi Survivor. But if I may to conclude this video, allow me to read a response in its entirety to IGN whining that there wasn't enough black people in Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy producer Yoshida responds, This is a difficult question, but not one that was unexpected. Seeing as diversity in entertainment media has become a much discussed topic as of late, the answer I have, however, may end up being disappointing to some depending on individual expectations. Our design concept from the earliest stages of development has always heavily featured medieval Europe, incorporating historical, cultural, political, and anthropological standards that were prevalent at the time. When deciding on a setting that was best suited to the story we wanted to tell, the story of the land beset by the blight, we felt that rather than create something on a global scale, it was necessary to limit the scope to a single landmass, one geographically and culturally isolated from the rest of the world in an age without airplanes, television, or telephones. Due to an underlying geographical, technological, and geopolitical constraints of this setting, Velisthea was never going to realistically be as diverse as, say, modern-day Earth or even Final Fantasy XIV that has an entire planet and moon worth of nations, races, and cultures at its disposal. The isolated nature of this realm, however, does end up playing a large part in the story, as is one of the reasons Valisthea's fate is tied to the rest of the world. Ultimately, we felt that while incorporating ethnic diversity into Valisthea was important, an over-incorporation into this single corner of a much larger world could end up causing a violation of those narrative boundaries we originally set for ourselves. The story we were telling is fantasy, yes, but it is also rooted in reality. Conversely, the Final Fantasy series of games have always inherently dealt with conflict and struggle, especially between those empowered and those used and or exploited by those privileged few, a prominent trend in human history. In a game, 
that by design allows players to experience the conflict and struggle firsthand through dynamic, realistic battles, it can be challenging to assign distinctive ethnicities to either antagonist or protagonist without triggering audience preconceptions, inviting unwarranted speculation, and ultimately stoking flames of controversy. The best part of pulling inspiration directly from history, however, is that it allows us to revisit and re-examine our own pasts while also allowing us to create something new. In the end, we simply want the focus to be less on the outward appearance of our characters and more on who they are as people, people who are complex and diverse in their natures, backgrounds, beliefs, personalities, and motivations, people whose stories we can resonate with. There is diversity in Valisthea. Diversity that, while not all-encompassing, is synergistic with the setting we've created and is true to the inspirations from which we are drawing. End quote. Based. Make characters. Not identities to pander. Even SNL and their unfunny ass has taken woke media and just lampooned it effectively i'm gay that's everything you are that's not a character but if it were in the hands of these losers defending trash like redfall telling us we're violent because we have any kind of criticism this is where we'd end up and y'all don't get to call the shots you're not in control of the narrative so that's not the future that we're choosing I'll be buying and playing Final Fantasy from the sounds of it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>